Hi everybody. Thanks for joining this discussion about flexible and scalable integration in automation industry and industrial IoT. My name is Kai Wenner. I work for Confluent and today I want to show you how to do Kafka native end-to-end -end integration in IIoT scenarios leveraging Kafka Connect, KSQL and Apache PLC4X. Here is the agenda for this session. I will first talk quickly about the use cases for IIoT and how to combine that with cloud, big data and machine learning. And then I will talk about the challenges of automation industry. And then the more interesting part, of course, how to solve these challenges with an end-to-end -end architecture, leveraging Kafka and PLC4X. So I will talk about these technologies, how to combine them and when to use them or maybe when not to use them and another IoT solution instead of that. I will conclude with an example about supply chain optimization and scale in real time, which is a great example for IIoT with Apache Kafka and PLC4X. Let's first start with some use cases and talk about the motivation for all these discussions we have with our customers. So as you see here, the world has changed. I think everybody agrees on that. We develop software completely different from a few years ago. We talk about things like cloud and of course, Internet of Things, and then also some fancy stuff like machine learning to do real-time analytics, for example. So to summarize this up, in the end, there is three new requirements you have to build your applications. You need a new scale because you have many, many devices and machines to integrate. They produce a lot of data. You need to do it at another speed. So for many scenarios, real time is either mandatory or it adds a lot of benefits compared to 24 hour batch processing, for example. And the third part is that you need to do it in an efficient way. This means you need to be more agile and flexible, try out new things, throw them away if they don't work or deploy them to production and scale them up if they add value to your use case. So this is a completely new scenario compared to 10, 20 years ago and you need new technologies and architectures to solve these problems. If you take a look at this, many people are talking about industry 4.0 or also about industrial IoT. And the main goal is to automate manufacturing more and more. So go from the very manual step on the left side to the automated intelligent steps on the right side to be more efficient and less costly. That's the main intention of IIoT, uh, automate all the things, scale it up, be more reliable, more secure, and leverage the data which is produced under the hood to improve the processes even more. There's many different use cases which we can build here. And I don't want to focus on specific examples here. I will do that at the end of the session with supply chain as one example. But in general, it's really about many different opportunities. Like, for example, analytics. You can ingest all the data from the sensors, machines and devices for doing analytics with that. That's a huge added value already because today most people have factories, but they don't leverage the data to build new use cases on top of that, like reducing the cost or like doing a more flexible integration. So that's possible, but you need to do the right tooling for that. And then, of course, you can use fancy things like machine learning and data science to do predictions on the data, for example, for predictive maintenance or other additional services. So you can now collect all the data from the machines and then also use it, like doing pre-processing and monitoring. All of that, if it makes sense or is valuable, then in real time. And with that, you can then also reduce cost a lot. You can sell additional services on top of the machines. That's where most vendors are going to. So you don't just sell machines, but you want to sell additional services. More and more vendors, for example, do not sell machines, but you can really subscribe to them, like for 36 months, including all the support, all the replacements, all in one as a sole service. Similar to the cloud business where you uh, rent everything as a service instead of buying the hardware and the software. And then, of course, um, you can not just ingest the data and process it, but it's really, you can scale it up to monitor more and more large volumes of data. That's important because all these machines and robots produce a lot of data. And the goal is in the end, not just to use some proprietary monoliths, but to integrate 
many different technologies and scaled it up and combined the data. That's very important to get all the value out of the information. And with that, often the final goal is really not just to integrate some different machines or robots, but to really control the, the whole factory, to build a smart factory and manage everything. And that means really at scale, to add more and more machines and robots, to do the processing and analytics in real time, to get the most value out of that, and to be flexible, to integrate different technologies, new proprietary protocols or open standards. And with that, then you can integrate with both the legacy proprietary protocols, but also with modern technologies, either on-prem or in the cloud. So here you see a lot of high level examples of what you can do with the data. And with that, I think if you are working in the space, you can already imagine how much added value you can get if you do this on a technical level the right way. So let's talk about the challenges because of course you want to integrate all the data and process it in real time at scale. But unfortunately in IIoT, it's not that easy. If we take a short look at the history of automation industry compared to big data and cloud, then this is a really great graphic here. It was created or got by Christopher Dutz from CodeCentric, who did a great talk about that. He's a committer of PLC4X, which I will talk about later. Here you see on the left side that in automation industry, the machines, they live for a long, long, long time. That's not really comparable to software we develop today in Java or .NET or Python. So you see here um, the development life cycles and production life cycles of machines like Siemens S3, S5, F7 or Schneider Electric. They are for 10, 20, 30 years. And even after the official support ends, maybe after 20 years, the machines are still running in production. You cannot simply replace machines for millions of dollars when they are running and working well. On the other side, if you take a look now at um, big data and cloud with all the different emerging technologies, big data, mostly open source like Hadoop, Spark or Kafka, and also all the big cloud vendors like Amazon, Google or Microsoft, they came up maybe 10, 15 years ago. And so it's a much shorter life cycle. And they also add many new services all the time, right? So AWS today has, I think, over a thousand services. So it's not like you define one standard or service and use it for 20 years. So that's very different. And so you, here you see already the challenge of combining these two different kinds of concepts. So to be in more detail, what's the challenge? So IoT is not the same as IIoT. In normal Internet of Things, you talk about connected car infrastructures or smart home where you connect everything. That's typically large scale. So for connected cars, you have to connect millions of devices with the rest of the enterprise in a scalable and reliable way, typically using open and modern technologies. On the other side, in industrial IoT, it's typically slow, it's unsecure, and it's not scalable with proprietary technologies. So here we are talking about two very different worlds. And in IIoT, you also typically talk about legacy and proprietary technologies. It's not like there are standards like HTTP or maybe like MQTT, like in normal IoT space, but it's about incompatible protocols. And most of them are proprietary by the specific vendors. So for example, Siemens with S7, that's, that's proprietary. It's not an open protocol. And you still want to integrate that and combine that with the rest of your enterprise. So this is a huge challenge and therefore there is also a standard in industrial IoT which is called OPC UA. However, um, that's also not really the best solution in many cases because you still have to add a server side to the machines and update the machines with that. You have to add license costs for each OPC UA server. So it also has its disadvantages and it's not the, the most easy and flexible way to do the integration. And I will cover this specific topic also later on a slide. Another challenge, as I mentioned before, is the product life cycles, which is really tens of years. And of course, the factories cost millions, so you cannot simply change and upgrade things. But what's even more concerning is you, that you also use very old technology, which is not uh, be used to update it. So most machines today, for example, still use Windows 7 and you often even can't install service packs. So that's um, ridiculous from a software perspective to run without the most new security updates. 
So it's not really secure what you run in the machines and factories. And therefore, the, the mantra still is stay with your well-known vendor forever because you also cannot change the software easily or you cannot change it at all because it's proprietary and you work with the vendor you worked with for the last 30 years. Another big challenge is, of course, that these, these proprietary solutions then from these vendors are not really built for scale or for, for flexibility. These vendors don't want you to extend it to integrate with other interfaces or technologies. If you run Siemens protocols, then you have to use the Siemens middleware for that. So there's also no real failover. You typically have a backup machine, which is the same hardware running, um, and then you can st start it if the other one breaks, and uh, that's the kind of backup you have. So there is no 24-7 deployment with real replication, like which you have in today's distributed systems on software side, typically. And of course, another very concerning thing is that typically in automation industry, you have no security capabilities. So in automation industry, security typically means safety. That means if you press the button to stop the machine, then it stops. That's safe. And, and this is how it works in machines. And that's what many people understand under security in automation industry. So uh, machines and industrial IoT is insecure by nature. So especially if you have the 10, 20, 30 year old factories. So there is no authentication or authorization or encryption like you know it from software development today. And the mantra is more like our factory building and network is secure. There is no access from outside. So people cannot get into the factory because we have security people there. And well, if you now think about the other part of the story that all companies want to move the data to the cloud and do big data analytics with that, that that's really contradictory to uh, these kind of security issues you have in the factories today. So there is a lot of challenges and to explain why these challenges exist, let's take a quick look at the core foundation of these factories. So in these factories or in the machines you have so-called PLCs programmable logic controller. That's 30, 40 years old, that's small gray boxes, which are built for controlling the manufacturing processes. And these PLCs are in every factory. So they are easy to program because they are not really powerful. They, they have some if else logic and these things to, to, the, to the controlling of the processes. And it's typically a combination of hardware and software, uh, but the software is more like a firmware where you load user programs to that. And <clears throat> another problem, problem of that is that it's really a highly fragmented market. Every single vendor has its own solution, which is typically proprietary and also not flexible and not extendable. Like if you see here some examples like Siemens, Bakehoff, Schneider Electronics, Allen Bradley, and so on. And a really concerning part here also is that this is the state of the art in automation industry, even in 2019, which we have today. So that's really a challenge, I would say, if you want to go to big data, cloud and analytics. Here's just one example. I got that from PLC4X website, which I will cover later in this session. Um, here you see, for example, Siemens S7 communication, which is really a, a, a complex protocol. It's actually a whole family of protocols where you use Profinet protocols and S7 COM protocols. And what's even more concerning again is this, that these kind of protocols are not standards and it's not open typically. So you have to really take a look at the technology and sometimes depending on the vendor you work with, you have to decompile the data format by yourself because there is no public description of it. So it's really hard to build a flexible integration layer on top of that if not even the, the interface is open for you. And, and that's one of the reasons why I typically use the software of this specific vendor to do the integration with these machines. However, on the other side, when we now talked about the challenges with these proprietary protocols and integration and the demand for that, here you see a few trends from um, an interesting report from IoT Analytics, a, a research company about IoT. And here you see that um, the, the industrial connectivity market size is growing a lot because more and more companies need to integrate their industrial assets to leverage the data, to build new use cases, to sell additional services on top of that, to reduce costs. So that's in the end what's coming. So you need to integrate the data more and more. And also we see this kind of 
IT and industrial automation convergence. So they are merging to each other. However, as you see here in the mid in, in 2010, where you tried to do this with something like a monitoring tool like SCADA on I, IoT side and then MES systems and on the software side, something like an SAP ERP system, for example, uh, that, that's not really working well. It, it does not scale. It's not reliable. It's not highly available. You need to build a more scalable, reliable and flexible architecture today. Also, if you then want to integrate to cloud to do big data analytics with all the data, that, that's not the way it was 20 years ago where you had a little bit of data, but now with all the automation, with the robots, with the sensors, you need to do a new solution for that. And, and that's a huge challenge you have today. And what in, in the upcoming minutes of this talk, what I want to talk about how you can do that in, a, in an easy and good way. Because that's really hard. If you think about again, to summarize the challenges on the left side, automation industry with the 30 year life cycle. And on the other side, we want to integrate all the data at scale in real time and analyze it and leverage it. So um, to get from the dinosaurs to the, to the modern technology, it's, it's really hard. And if you don't have a magician, like, like you see on the right side, then you need some good technologies, which, you can, which can help you here to do the right architecture. Because here is an example of how that looks in the past. So um, for, for example, if you use a, a Siemens protocol for all the Siemens machines, then use the, the Siemens integration middleware monolith to, to build all of that. And on the other side, if you also have a Modbus in your infrastructure, then you use Schneider Electric behind that and their monolith to integrate that. And then sometimes on top of that, you use another integration middleware to integrate all of that. And like the, the specific vendor solutions, it's a monolith, which is not scalable, not flexible, not reliable. So it, it's really hard to do all of that. So we need a new architecture to do that in a more scalable and, and flexible way. Because there is a huge demand for that. And I think if you work in the space, you totally agree that you need to do many different things in the future. And cost reduction, of course, is one thing, but it's even more important to be flexible, to integrate with new standards and technologies, to be able to scale up in a reliable way, in a secure way, and extend it as you need, build new applications and services on top of that. That's really hard if you just have proprietary protocols. Um, you want to build new applications with, with the technology which makes most sense for that, whatever framework or solution that is as interface. And typically also today, people want to be infrastructure independent. You still might deploy it on premise or you already go to cloud or maybe even to serverless solutions for a part of your uh, so problem implementations. So with that, we now talked a lot about the challenges in automation industry for the different use cases. So now let's think how we can build that with an end-to-end -end integration architecture. Here's a very high level IoT architecture. It misses a lot of the details because it's not that simple, of course, on both sides. But in the end, what, what I will explain today is how you can integrate with all the different machines and IoT technologies using a, a streaming platform. Because a streaming platform is really built for large scale, for real-time processing and for being reliable, even if infrastructure fails, if servers are down, if the network is down. And then on top of that, you can build all the different use cases. This can be things like sensor analytics in real time, but also fancy stuff like predictive maintenance in near real time, where you leverage different technologies. Or it can still be batch processes, like for reporting or for training analytic models. That's totally fine. And it doesn't matter if it's on-prem or in the cloud, but it's typically separated from the machines and factories where you get the data from. And what's also important, what I will cover today is an architecture which is really flexible. You can run it at the edge, on-prem or in different clouds and combine all of that. So either you, <coughs> either you self-manage all of that by your, in yourself in, in the data center or in the cloud, or you even use fully managed services for parts of this problem. And you combine that as you need it to integrate all the data and process the data at scale in a reliable way. That's what I want to show you today with open standards and open source technologies so that you can build what you want to do on top of that. Here is one diagram with a use case or with an architecture example. I will come back to that later at the specific example, which I talk in the end of the talk. 
But here you see on the left side, you have all the machine sensors, which are um, integrated somehow either with the PLCs, which are used in the factories or maybe with direct standard interfaces. And no matter if it's standard based or proprietary, then you ingest the data to a streaming platform where you can process the data. So either you continuously process the data in real time at scale, like you see at the top, which is one example to do filtering aggregations or also build business logic on top of that. And then in this example on the top, we also ingest the, the data into an uh, analytic model. So where we can do fancy machine learning. Of course, there's many different use cases what you can do. This is already a more advanced architecture of many different examples. And on the bottom right, you see you can also do batch integration, of course, if that makes sense. For reporting, for example, or for human interaction, if a, a person wants to do some queries on the data to analyze it. On a high level, the key here is that you integrate to all the different technologies, either standard-based or proprietary, from the factories, from the machines and continuously be able to process the data and combine the data to leverage it. And then, of course, also to send data back to the machines and devices. So when you have the information, then you want to, for example, stop a machine before it breaks and you want to replace a part. That's all possible with this architecture. If you need to do that in real time, if all uh, interfaces are capable of that, but of course also to integrate with other communication paradigms like batch or request response for the web UI or even human interaction. So with this discussion about the high level architecture for end-to-end -end integration, let's now take a look at the specific technologies I want to talk about. And here I will now cover Apache Kafka as even streaming platform. Apache Kafka was built around 10 years ago at LinkedIn. And here you see already the first use case they have built it was already to integrate many different systems. And this was for both for legacy systems like their Oracle database, which is not really scalable and flexible and also very expensive. So a little bit comparable to the, to the legacy protocols and standards in, in the IIoT phase, a space where you have these kind of proprietary machines, which can be integrated only with one monolith solution, which is proprietary and costly. And on the other side, however, you also want to integrate with modern new technologies, which are open, which are scalable to do big data analytics, to do real time processing, to do graph analytics, to build recommendation engines and all the other use cases you have, which you cannot build just with the proprietary systems. This is what LinkedIn built Kafka for. And Kafka under the hood, it's really a streaming platform, which means it's, it's much more than just messaging, which some people think. So Kafka, as you see on the right side, it's publish, subscribe messaging, but it's also a storage system to decouple the different producers from the consumers. And it's also capable of processing the data continuously at scale. <coughs> so here you see an example. Um, <coughs> Sorry for that. The, the Kafka is really the de facto standard for real-time event streaming. We, we see it in every company, in every industry in the meantime. And it's so good because it decouples the different systems. And in IIoT, you have all the machines which produce sensor data and they can push the data into Kafka no, more, no matter at what speed or how much data it is. And then the consumers are completely decoupled from it. It could be a real-time consumer, which does things like analytics in real time. It can be a batch consumer, or it can be human interaction, which analyzes the data. That's the great thing about Kafka. And with that, it's really built for large scale and highly reliable, and also in an open way with an open source framework. Here are just a few examples for Kafka at scale, like LinkedIn processes over 4 to 5 trillion messages a day with Kafka, or Netflix processes over 6 petabyte of data per day. So it's really scalable. And I also want to point another thing out here. So while here you see a few examples of the tech companies from Silicon Valley, Kafka is not just used by the tech giants. I will show that on the next slides with a few examples. So it's really re relevant in every company on, on, on this planet in the meantime, which has data to process. And also very important, Kafka is not just used for big data. Many of the use cases we see, it's really about smaller critical data sets, like for bank payments or really also for transactional data, which is relevant for machines and IIoT. 
Here's a few different use cases just to show you how um, our customers use Kafka in many different scenarios, like for increasing revenue, decreasing cost or mitigating risk. And in the end, I just want to show it's used in every different industry, including IIoT and, and Internet of Things in general. Um, not just for IoT sensor ingestion, like as one example here in the middle, where Audi uses it for their connected car infrastructure to ingest data from millions of cars, to process the data in real time for analytics, for recommendations, for predictive maintenance and so on. But it's also really used for building mission critical business applications around the data. And in case of, of machines and manufacturing, it could be things like selling additional services like that you don't sell just the hardware for the machine, but also services like um, doing updates to it, providing new services on top of the machine to be up to date with the requirements and use cases. So if you want to dig deeper into this, check out the slide deck and all the links I have for you for the different use cases of Kafka. Kafka under the hood, it's a distributed commit log. So it's a distributed system, it's reliable, it's built for failure. So even if nodes or network is down or you have other problems, still the system is not down. So it's built for 24 seven deployments and, and that's really huge and important for IoT scenarios like, like manufacturing. And you can also easily scale it up and down. You can add new producers, new consumers. You can scale up the cluster and all that without downtime. Even in case of upgrades, you use things like rolling upgrades and dynamic configuration so that your system is never down. And, and that's huge because most of the systems have to run 24 seven in a critical way. Kafka is a distributed system. So um, the topics are also distributed over different servers, often in different data centers or cloud regions. And that's why what makes it so reliable. And, and here from a, a business perspective, that's really the critical thing that uh, the producers send data to this commit log and then the consumers can consume the data when they want and need to consume it. One consumer could be a real-time processor which uh, processes data in milliseconds and aggregates it. Another one could be a batch analytics system which just consumes all the data overnight, maybe because the cloud instance is cheaper and because the report is fine if it's coming in the morning for the manager every day at 7, at 7 a.m. for example. So that's a huge advantage because Kafka decouples the producers from all the different consumers. And under the hood, how that works is that there is um, very common concepts in distributed uh, systems like you have the leader follower principle, you have replication, and with that, then you have partitions which you replicate to different servers so that even if nodes or hardware or even a data standard is down, the system is not down and you can still operate your system 24 seven without data loss. I don't want to go into much more details here. There's many other talks which describe Kafka in more detail and why it works so well. On top of Kafka, there's many additional components which you typically leverage, like the schema registry, which allows governance so that um, all the data you integrate um, works well together. So you define schemas like in a database table and with that you can integrate the different systems very well. What's very important to understand is that Kafka, it's not just a messaging and storage layer. That's the core of Kafka, of course, the Kafka brokers, which build a cluster. But Kafka also includes Kafka Connect and Kafka Streams. So if you download the Kafka project from the Apache website, these two components are also included. And it's very relevant, especially also for the IIoT use cases, where you want to integrate with many different systems, both on the source side for the machines and sensors, and on the sync side for doing analytics and other real-time processing. So Kafka Streams is a stream processing engine which leverages Kafka under the hood. So you have all the features of Kafka like high availability, high throughput to continuously process the data with just a little bit of code and Java or Scala. And that makes it pretty easy to continuously process data even for millions of messages from thousands of machines or factories to integrate and process the data at scale in a reliable way. As I said, I, I don't want to go into detail into these Kafka basics, so you can check out other webinar recordings and so on to learn more about that. Another option is KSQL, which is a layer on top of Kafka Streams. It's, it's the same technology under the hood, but you just write SQL commands. So you can use it from any programming language like Python or .NET. You can also do the, the commands from a command line interface or from a graphical user interface like Control Center or your own web application. 
And that's really huge because it makes it much easier to continuously process data. Here you see the two different examples. So whatever makes more sense for you, you can write code or you can write SQL queries to continuously process the data. And, and that's really huge because as you see on the right side, with just a single query, you can continuously process millions of messages per second and scale it up in a reliable way. And if you think about machines and sensor data, that, that's really huge because you can do a lot of different nice things with just a few commands and deploy that to production without any other adjustments. The other part, and that's now even more relevant for the topic we talk about today with end-to-end -end integration, is Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect is also running native Kafka. So this means you integrate with many different sources and think and leverage Kafka under the hood for large scalability and high reliability. Because it also uses replication, topics, partitions, leadership, all the concepts from Kafka. And on top of that, you can just do configuration, like you know it from any legacy ETL or enterprise service bus tool, to integrate with different systems. Here's just a few examples. So you can check out, for example, the Confluent Hub, which provides many different sources and things. And that includes several IoT connectors, like, for example, for MQTT and other um, relevant technologies. The great thing is, as I said, you just use the connector and configure it. The implementation is already done. Um, some are open source, some are commercial from Confluent, some are from other partners which are certified by Confluent. So there are many different options. Just check it out and think about what you might need. And this makes it much easier to do the end-to-end -end integration because you don't have to implement this connectivity. You just set up the Kafka cluster or run it as a service in Confluent Cloud. And then you configure the connectors, for example, to ingest the data from MQTT data streams and then send it into something like Elasticsearch for um, text search and maybe into a real-time uh, communication system. Here's another talk I had a year ago at Kafka Summit San Francisco, where I talk about in detail how to integrate with MQTT and Internet of Things scenarios like a connected car infrastructure. This includes discussions about Kafka Connect, MQTT, our MQTT proxy, our REST proxy, and also a few live demos. So if you want to learn more about that in general, um, check out these slides and this video recording. However, today, as we are talking about IIoT, and as I explained in the beginning, this is a little bit different because um, the, the, the machines in the factory, they don't support MQTT typically. So this is really about legacy, about proprietary protocols, 20, 30 years old. old. So here you have different challenges to solve. So it's, it's a very different world. If you talk about IIoT, you need to integrate with Siemens S7 and Modbus and other technologies. So the question now is we understood that Kafka is really the de facto standard for integrate at scale in a reliable way and to decouple producers from consumers. So it's perfect for automation industry. However, you still need to think about, okay, so how can I connect to these kind of machines and the PLCs and so on? And that's what I want to cover in the second part of the technical overview. Now let's talk about Apache PLC 4X. PLC4X is also an Apache top level project like Apache Kafka. And here you already seen the name, what it means. PLC is, as I discussed in the beginning, the, 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 the hardware in the end, which integrates with the machines. And so you need to integrate with that to integrate with the legacy protocols. And for anything means on the one side, you can use different um, technologies like not just Java, but also C++ or in the future other programming language. But what's even more important for me is that you can then integrate to any other sync, which can be a big data analytics tool, which can be a real-time processor or even many more of them. The main architecture behind that is that you build different adapters like in, in JDBC. And with these kind of what's called drivers in PLC4X, you can just add a new driver to integrate with a new legacy protocol and technology. As you see on the right side, um, several of these technologies or interfaces are already implemented like Beckhoff IDS, Modbus or Siemens S7, Step7 and others are in the works right now. So that's very important because now you can also easily implement a specific driver if your proprietary interface is not implemented here already. But it's a, it's a 
framework which standardizes this kind of integration with all these proprietary legacy protocols all the same way and that's really huge here you see one code example of plc4x and if, if you're used to jdbc you see that it's very similar so jdbc is for database integration and you just uh, use the driver which you want to use or the adapter like for postgres for oracle for ibm db2 and, and the coding in the end is all the same right and the same is true for plc 4x where you have the driver manager and then you just upload the the right driver for your connectivity like in this case in the in the first line we see we connect to s7 and that's in the end the interface here and under the hood the, the co coding the processing that's the same no matter which protocols you integrate. So you can even integrate with many different drivers to different protocols and then use the same uh, custom logic to, to process the data and integrate that and use it. So this is the solution which I really like a lot for IIoT scenarios. You combine Apache Kafka as scalable and reliable even streaming platform to integrate with the rest of the enterprise. And then you use the PLC4X Kafka Connect connector to deploy this integration in a reliable way. Because remember Kafka Connect, it's natively using Kafka under the hood with replication, with high availability and so on. And if you use the PLC4X connector and deploy that in Kafka Connect, this integration to all these legacy protocols is, only highly re is also highly re reliable and scalable. And you can integrate to endless systems, machines and devices because Kafka scales well enough with that. So you can, uh, add new connectivity step by step without having problems scaling this integration. And, and therefore this is a huge advantage. And it's also very flexible because you would integrate each machine directly with PLC4X and Kafka. You don't need a specific monolith anymore for Siemens S7 and another monolith for Modbus. You all integrate that in the way you want with Kafka and the rest of the enterprise to do the processing and analytics. So one more thing about PLC4X versus OPC UA. OPC UA is a standard which is more or less the, 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 the tried solution to, do a, to insert a standard into the automation industry. So it's also, it's great, it's an open standard and with all the pros and cons of it. So um, the pro is of course, it's a standard and every vendor can implement it. The con is that it's really slow adoption like every standard from software perspective, you might know that about Java EE, for example. And therefore, it's also often inflexible because it takes a lot of time and it's it's not implementing all the features you need. And what what's more concerning for me is really that you still require a new app server. You need an OPC UA server on top of every PLC. And that's really a lot of trouble if, uh, if you want to be agile and flexible and um, also because it costs money for every single app server again. So it's, it's not really ideal if you just want to integrate with these legacy protocols. And it's also often over-engineered. If you just want to integrate with very simple PLC for PLC logic and, and just read the data, so why do you need a new app server and implement a new protocol and, and fit that all together again? And also then this OPC UA server increases the load on the PLCs. So it, it, it's not really the ideal solution for every use case. If it's good for use case, then use it. It's a standard, right? So it's, it's um, okay. But for many use cases, I think it has a lot of disadvantages, especially if you compare it now to PLC4X, which is also an open source framework and the Apache 2.0 license. And the, what I really like is the unified API that you just add your drivers under the hood for example, for S7 or Modbus or Backoff. And with that, you don't need to modify the existing hardware. And that's one of the biggest benefits. You just connect directly to the existing machines and protocols with no increased load. And also, of course, no need to pay for licenses to activate OPC UA. So, so that's a huge difference, I think. And um, even if you need to integrate with some machines which have OPC UA, then PLC4X also has a PLC has a UPC UA adapter interface available. So you can use both together. So there is not a need or nor decision. But I think there is many advantages of using PLC4X as you see here compared to the OPC UA standard for integrating with the legacy protocols. 
So after this technical overview, and hopefully you now understand why Kafka and PLC Forex are a great combination for end-to-end -end integration in automation industry, let's take a look at a specific example, supply chain optimization at scale in real time. Here now we come back to the picture I showed you before, but now with some specific technologies. Um, I hope this makes sense to you now, but here you see on the left side still the machine sensors and then the different PLCs which you can integrate to. And now we use Kafka as streaming platform and Kafka Connect with the PLC 4X connector to integrate all that data. And then on top we use KSQL in this case to write some simple SQL queries to continuously process and aggregate the sensor information. And then we can also, like in this case, use an advanced fancy thing like using TensorFlow to train a model with the data, for example, for predictive maintenance. So this means that you ingest all the data into TensorFlow to train a model. And this um, can be, for example, in the cloud where you can do it really at large scale in an agile and flexible way. But then you can also deploy the trained model either in the cloud as a service if you want to do it like that, or you can deploy it back in the machines on the left side. That's where you are very flexible because model training and model inference are separated from each other. I have a lot of other material like GitHub examples and talks and articles talking about Kafka and machine learning. So, so this is not what I want to cover here in more detail. And as you see in the, on the bottom right, you can of course also integrate to different systems. That's the beauty of Kafka. So while we do um, real-time processing with KSQL on top and ingesting the data in TensorFlow for training a model, in parallel to that, we also have another consumer which ingests the data into Spark for batch processing. And on top of that, also maybe the human wants to use a Jupyter notebook to do some analysis on top of that. So that's the beauty of Kafka that many different consumers can consume the data. One can be batch, one can be real time, and another one can maybe be a web application for a human. That's all decoupled from each other, but still highly available and scalable. And therefore here, I hope you now see that with Kafka and PLC4X, you have a great option to integrate with all the legacy protocols and really use the data to process, to analyze, to aggregate it. And then of course, the last important part, to send data back to the machines. That's also possible. Today, 90% of the use cases about consuming and reading data because that's already so much huge advantage. But I'm pretty sure when the companies have done this, then they also want to send data back to the machines based on this information. Also often in real time, where you analyze the data in the cloud or in the data center, and based on these aggregations or maybe on the analytic models and the inference, you can detect anomalies or other things and send this back to the machine. For example, again, to stop it, predictive maintenance. If a machine breaks in the next hours, stop it and replace a part before it breaks. So here is one specific example, supply chain optimization in real time at scale. As we've seen in the beginning, there's many, many different use cases, but here now you might get a, a feeling of how this looks for one specific use case. In supply chain, as you see here in gray, the physical operations are things like on the left side, the planners forecast a long-term schedule, and then the production begins. And then later, as you see on the right side in gray, um, you change the orders to supply chain, to inventory and then manufacturing schedules. That's a normal supply chain process, maybe over weeks, over months. And then often, like here in blue, you have batch analytics using other frameworks to do production forecasting and, and re-optimizing the plants. So that's already great. Um, and here's often where we also still see Kafka for ingesting all the IoT data to do the batch analytics. However, um, there is huge added value if you can even do many of these tasks in real time. And therefore, it, it's often a combination of batch systems and real time systems so that you can do smarter and faster decisions. Like in the middle, um, if, if you can do the, the forecasts in real time, you can make decisions much faster and better than just doing it uh, compared to this every week or every month or even every day. Making decisions in real time or maybe every five minutes or every hour can save you a lot of money and make your supply chain much more efficient. So and based on the story here, you see um, one example how that would look like from a technology perspective. You, so you integrate with Kafka Connect and PLC 4X connector to the machines, ingest the data in real time. And here on the one side, you process the data, for example, with native Kafka technologies like Kafka Streams or KSQL. And in this case, we train a model with TensorFlow for the production forecast. 
And then also we use Kafka Connect on the right side to integrate with Spark for batch processing and for manual human interaction with Jupyter Notebooks. And on the other side, we also on the top right deploy a real-time Kafka application, which compares the actual plants to the uh, the actual information to the plants in real time. So that's just one example of um, how supply chain optimization could look like if you need to do that at scale in a reliable way in real time together with batch processing. We have done a webinar um, at Confluent together with our partner Xpero, which is an SI partner who implements these kind of projects. So if you want to hear more details about that, um, here um, we are talking just 30 minutes only about this supply chain optimization in real time at scale, if you want to understand this in more detail. So with that, the last thing I want to cover, why is Confluent really great for these IIoT projects? So. Confluent is in the end um, the, the biggest contributor of Apache Kafka, the open source um, framework. So the founders at LinkedIn, they created Confluent to bring Kafka to enterprise level. And with that, we have the Confluent platform, which does not just include Kafka completely and support it 100% in the newest version, but we provide additional tooling and, and components on top of that. Like you have seen many different connectors for the different systems and also easy tooling for operations and security add-ons. And we do that for self-managed either in the local data center or factory or in the public cloud um, or any combination of that, including a fully managed Confluent cloud service. So you're free of choice and even um, the most common scenario in IIoT, I think, is hybrid deployments anyway where you have Kafka clusters often running in the factories and then also replicate data to the cloud for further analysis in real time at scale and to integrate with the rest of the enterprise. So with that, um, we see many customers using Confluent for IoT projects. So one reason, of course, it's based on open source and de facto standards for IoT projects. Um, the, the license costs, even for a subscription with support, are relatively cheap compared to what um, the typical IIoT uh, products and solutions are charged for. So you can spend much more budget on doing the, the, the project itself, right? To do the real things, not just buying software and still having the problems. It's really mission critical deployments. So Kafka and Confluent, we are doing that in any industry at scale in a reliable way. And even for IoT, I think that's re relevant for many different industries like automotive, manufacturing, oil and gas, telco. We see it almost everywhere with significant importance. And, and one key difference to many of the other IoT solutions on the market is that it's a flexible architecture. It's lightweight footprint on commodity hardware, and you can really pick what you need and deploy where you want it. So it's, it's flexible and also complementary to other frameworks and technologies. So even if you have other IoT solutions like Siemens MindSphere or Cisco Kinetic, or maybe cloud services like Google Cloud IoT or Amazon IoT, that's totally fine. And often these complement each other because an open, even streaming platform has different characteristics and advantages compared to an IoT solution. And with that you can be flexible and customize it and build for a specific use case you have and still combine it with the other product if you want or need to. And also key is really battle tested at large scale. And even in hybrid deployments where some parts are running in the cloud and some parts are running on-prem. And in includes the important things like security and, and reliability as core concepts. So that's really important. And then you can also elastically scale. Start small with one integration, one end-to-end -end pipeline, and then add more and more machines, and then add more and more factories all over the world. And do this kind of global event streaming platform deployments where you integrate everything with each other and with the rest of the enterprise in hybrid deployments and totally independent of a specific infrastructure or vendor. And then, of course, um, there's also you can still work with the partners like either like Siemens MindSphere or AWS, but also with other specific IoT partners like HiveMQ for MQTT or PLC4X for um, industrial IoT. There, there's always the option to combine it with others because it's open and flexible. If you use Kafka and Confluent, you can combine it with everything else. It's not just a single monolith. And with that, then you can integrate with anything. So both on the legacy side, um, where you have proprietary protocols like Siemens S7, Modbus, Allen Bradley, and so on. But also with the standards like for IoT, like MQTT or OPC UA. 
And that's the one side. And then on the other side, you can integrate with the rest of the enterprise. This can be modern technologies like S3 Object Store, HDFS, MongoDB, any other analytics tooling. And also, of course, any modern application like business services like Salesforce CRM or any ERP system like SAP. And also, of course, as I said, other IoT solutions like Siemens MindSphere. So it's really a huge benefit um, to use Kafka and Confluent platform in your IoT projects. And we see it more and more because it's complementary and flexible and you can do it together with other solutions. So this is the last part of this talk to talk about. Uh, it's really important to understand um, Kafka and Confluent is not really competing with other frameworks or solutions. It's complementary to that. And that also, of course, depends on your use case, what you want to do. But um, especially in this kind of IoT environment, people get often asked, okay, so do, should we use Confluent or other IoT platform solutions or how do they work together? And as you see here, two examples, um, they work together very well. So either you can do it just with Kafka and Kafka Connect to directly integrate with the machines, right? Either with the, the standards, like even if it's just file-based or HTTP or other standards like MQTT or maybe the, the robot, oper robot operating system System ROS, or you can use the PLC4X connector to integrate with the, the legacy protocols of automation industry. Um, or of course, you can use Siemens MindSphere. If you just want to integrate with Siemens uh, PLCs, then Siemens MindSphere is, is probably great for that um, if you can afford it. And then still, um, these tools like Siemens or, or Cisco Kinetic, they also have Kafka connectors. So um, while Siemens MindSphere has great tooling for IoT to do maybe predictive maintenance, um, the event, event streaming platform of Kafka still allows you to integrate with the rest of your enterprise because Siemens MindSphere is not built as an ERP system or as a really analytical database or to build other additional services for that. That's what you do with Java or KSQL or any other tooling or application. And on the other side, um, if you want to use IoT's cloud services, you can also use it the other way around. You integrate with the machines via Kafka and the connectors, for example, and then ingest all the data into Azure IoT Hub or Google IoT or Amazon IoT to process it there, to, do, to manage the, the device management, to do the other IoT stuff you want to do with this, Google, uh, with this Microsoft Cloud service. And still in parallel to that then, you can not just ingest it to the IoT cloud service, but again, with any other application, your ERP system, your CRM system, um, your new business applications, all of that, because all these consumers are decoupled from each other. That's what Kafka make is so strong with because it decouples the producers and consumers because it's, it's not just a messaging system, it's really a streaming platform with messaging and storing and processing the data. So this is really a conclusion here. Um, Kafka and Confluent, it's complementary to other IoT solutions. And with that, I'm done with this webinar. I hope you learned a lot here. If you have any questions or feedback, please let me know. And please also connect on LinkedIn so that we stay connected to discuss these kind of IoT use cases in the future. Thanks a lot for joining the session.